Morning everyone, in today's video we're going to have a look at forming materials. So what you need to know are what the different forming methods are for plastics, metals, timbers and paper and board, what they do, why they're used and then it's really a good idea to be able to draw the diagram for the process out as well because in the exam sometimes it will say please use diagrams where necessary and it's definitely easier be able to draw a diagram and label it than it is to just write a paragraph explaining the process. So just making sure it doesn't need to be an incredibly like amazing piece of art sketch, but a clear diagram showing the process with labels is a really good idea. So we'll look at forming plastics first. So the first one is calendaring. So this is used typically anything like uh, plastic carrier bags, clean cling film, anything like that. So what happens is you have got you start off with your big Thick piece of plastic up at the top over here and then you've got your feeder rolls that feed the plastic through and then you've got your nip rollers and they pinch it together and as it goes through these rolls it's just slowly starting to compress it and pull it apart to make it thinner and thinner so once it's gone through the nip rollers it comes back through over to the tension rollers where it literally tension pulls it apart so it's made it nice and thin and then once it's the last little bit it goes through the embossing and cooling rollers so this is where you then will print on any graphics that you need to have for like say the Tesco's logo or anything like that. And then on the take up roller is where it comes off and then it'll be cut down to size. So it's just making sure you can tell what the different rollers are. So the feed roller is the one that actually feeds the material into the whole process. Uh, the nip rollers pinch it together and then it's pulled apart through the tension rollers then goes to the embossing and cooling rollers and then to take up where it is then cut to size. So typically anything like carrier bags, cling film, that type of thing. So next we've got extrusion. So extrusion is a process that will let you do basically long continuous pieces. Think things like uh, plastic guttering and piping and hose pipes and such like that. So what will happen is you've got your hopper up here so that's where your plastic granules will go in so it's like plastic pellets plastic powder uh, and what will happen is the gearbox turns this screw now this is called the archimedes screw or, or the archimedean screw so that will be rotated by the gear the gearbox and that forces the plastic granules or powder underneath the heaters now once it goes underneath the heaters it becomes a liquid and then it gets pushed through into the die. Now the die is what gives it the shape. So if you think about a die, if you have anyone when they were little ever had like those little play-doh machines where you put play-doh in and you push it through and you can turn it into like a star shape or a circular shape, the die essentially does the same type of thing. It's essentially the little shape that you want. Now if you have any hollow sections, you have what's called the mandrel in the middle of it and that's what lets it be hollow because it's a piece that won't let plastic go through it. And then when it comes through, it cooled down, so either sprayed by cold air or cold water, depending on what you're doing, and then it's cut down to size. But it let you do nice, long, continuous pieces. Uh, now, compared to some of the other processes, relatively cheap because the dyes aren't overly complicated to produce, so it's not as expensive. But you can't do anything overly complicated in terms of shapes. So next, you've got rotational molding. So this is where, if you need a plastic product to be one whole piece if you take things like kayaks obviously if um you had a kayak and it's made from two pieces there's always that risk where the join is that it will spring a leak and break so if it needs to be one solid piece rotational molding is the best way to do that you can make it as a, a rigid or flexible plastic depending on what you want to do you can get texture parts in it so on the inside of the mold you can have a textured surface on it and then once you mold it inside that mold the textured surface will imprint onto the plastic uh, so what will happen is you open your mould uh, and the plastic powder or granules is put into it and the mould is closed up. Then the mould is heated up and rotated around. Now what happens, it's called centrif centrifugal force, is as you rotate it, it forces the plastic around the outside of the mould. Then when it's done, it's cooled down and then it's released and the product is removed now typically what would happen is you've probably got three stations so you've got sort of three arms to the rotational molding process one station is where they're loading the plastic in next station is where they're heating it and rotating it and the third step is where they're 
emptying it out. So they're continuously doing it and they're just sort of rotating around as they're going. So next we've got blow molding. So this is a very, very fast process. So this will be typically for like plastic bottles and things like that. Uh, so molds can be expensive to begin with because they're a little bit more complete, complex. Uh, you are a little bit limited in terms of what you can do. You can't have any sharp corners or edges. So that's why you don't have any sharp corners like bottles. Because what will happen is the plastic wouldn't get into the corners. It needs to be sort of like curved. So if you see the diagram here, it's curved a little bit. That just means the plastic will go through it or go up to it a lot better. So what happens is you've got the extruder that has your paracin. Now, the paracin is not a type of plastic. It's just what that plastic part is called. So if it's going to be a bottle, for example, it'll be PET. So just note that paracin isn't a type of plastic. It's just what that is called. So you have your paracin. And what happens is the mold closes around it and pinches. Now, you'll notice that any plastic bottle Oh, it's like a little nipple that's where the pinching has taken place so that's always a hint for how something has been made so if it's been injection molded it's always got that little pinch bit at the bottom of it then what happens is hot air is blown into it like you will with a balloon and it expands around it instantly really really quickly um just put it into perspective for you if you imagine how many plastic bottles coca-cola make a day it's got to be a fast process because they're making thousands and thousands of these so it's literally Paracin goes in, mold closed, hot air blows out, mold done, open mold, finished. And then you just keep making them over and over and over again. So perfect for any hollow parts, hollow pieces, but as long as there's no like sharp edges to it. So we've then got a few other processes that are not as complex. So things like line bending, where you'll have a strip heater where you've just got a hot wire, and normally this will be done manually, you'll put your plastic onto the strip heater along the wire is where the plastic will bend um, will heat up a bit and then that's where you can bend it to certain angles you got vacuum forming which i'm sure many people have done before where you have your mold put your mold in the vacuum former uh, normally with some um, releasing agent like silicon spray or something like that then put a sheet of plastic over it which typically is hips high impact polystyrene the heater is pulled over it and it melts it heats the plastic up till it's soft then remove the heater and then what you do is you suck the air out of the plastic and then that forms around the shape that you've got. Now you do need to be careful with the shape because if you try and do it again, it's just like straight lines, it's going to be very difficult, if not impossible to get it out. You have to do what's called a draft angle, so it's easier to release. Then thermoforming, which is sort of similar to vacuum forming, but there's no vacuum part of it. What happens is you have your sheet, and you have your two molds and the molds are heated as opposed to the plastic and you just press them together and it takes the shape very very quickly next we've got injection molding so injection molding is similar to extrusion but is sort of it can do a lot more complex parts so in terms of how it's the same you've still got your hopper you still got your screw and you still got your heaters now instead of uh, just a gearbox and motor you've got a hydraulic ram that powers it so same thing will happen, your hopper with your plastic granules or your plastic powder goes down into the chamber where the screw is. The gearbox then turns the screw that makes it go into the heaters. And this is the key part that's different. Instead of a die, you've got a mould. Now this mould will let you do very, very complex shapes. So the thing around that is that moulds are very expensive. So the setup of injection moulding is a very expensive process, but once you've made once you've set it up you can make as many of the things as you want so actually in terms of being worthwhile the initial setup initial investment will be will be worth it in the long run as long as you're producing a lot of them. if you're going to just make like five or six of them you wouldn't bother injection molding it because it just would not be worth your time so plastic goes into the mold it will cool down mold is then opened and then the ejector pins then push the mold out and then compression molding, so this is used to form composites like uh, uh, glass reinforced polymers or carbon fiber reinforced polymers, so that's your CRP or your CFRP. So this is where you need a mold and then take the shape. And then what will happen, so we're talking about layup here at the minute. So you'll have your mold and then you'll have your resin and your roller. So the mold is sprayed, releasing agents this wax, so it'll come out nice and easily. So our top layer of gel is applied. The resin so that then starts to make it react 
and fiberglass matting so it all is cut to the side so fiberglass literally is if you've ever seen it it's just like a sheet and there's loads of fibers sticking out of it on its own doesn't do anything so you have to put it in place put resin on it and that starts the chemical reaction of it hardening and then the rollers are pushed across it to make it go along this the size of a mold and you do a couple of layers depending on how thick you need it to go typically you do like two or three layers depending on what you're trying to do and then you leave it to set so that's the layer then the last one is compression molding so this is where like with thermoforming so your molds are heated and then you'll just have your piece of material and the mold will just come down and then compression will just push out nice and quickly and that is how you'll form little parts like the um, casing for uh, plug sockets. So that is the end of plastic forming. So we're going to have a look at paper and card. So the most common one, you've got die cutting. So if you have a look at the diagram at the top, so die cutting is similar to like if you've ever had like a cutty cutter, uh, if, like if you've done baking. So you have your card and you'll have serrated edge, like sharp edges along the die and it'll just compression press down on the card and it'll imprint it and it'll come off like that and that's how you would then uh create um take flat card and fold it into a 2d a 3d shape like cereal boxes tissue boxes that sort of thing uh you can also you may not cut all the way through there may be ones where you just sort of crease the channels and that will make it so it is uh, foldable so some edges will be cut around the outside and the inside ones might just be like scored a little bit so that you can then uh, fold it much better as well you then also with bending there can be times where there will be a table so not only on the table where it's got die cutting it'll then have another table where it'll be set out so it will fold on hinges so it will fold up perfectly in line rather than someone trying to do it by hand the person now as well exams have started letting you use laser cutting as an example as well because you can cut out and engrave detailed next really quickly and really easily. Uh, it's become quite popular with um, wedding um, accessories in the wrong way, but like, like little uh, decorative pieces for weddings. So if you have like little um, things that go on tables, that people tend to like laser cut those nice because it's a lot faster. So we're going to have a look at forming metals. So spinning. So spinning is how you can take a piece of metal and turn it onto like a nice like cup sort of rounded shape so what will happen is you've got your mandrel that is put into the chuck this is like a lathe that will spin around so this is going to spin the whole time and as that is spinning you've then got your blank which is the metal sheet that you're going to form so that'll be clamped to it and then what happens is that's going to spin around and the roller is going to move up and down the mandrel forming the blank into the shape of the mandrel that you want. Now obviously the mandrel is what dictates the overall shape of the metal. Uh, and then once it's done, you remove it and you'll typically, so if you see on this diagram here, you've got the excess bits and you tend to tri um, trim off the excess bits that you don't want. Uh, nowadays, for the most part, this is normally done like CNC equipment, so it's done automatically by machine because it's a lot faster and a lot more accurate. Uh, we've got press forming. So this is where you'll have your piece of sheet metal, your blank, so typically in metal working, the original piece that you're going to form into something is normally called a blank and then it's clamped into place and turned into something else. So you, your blank is clamped into the die, then a hydraulic press pushes the die into the sheet metal, which takes, a, which takes the shape. So this is then the hydraulic press that is then forming around, taking the blank and turning it into the shape of the die. And then it's removed and then you've got your shape and again what you do is you will then trim the excess off as well um oh what i didn't mention by the way so at the minute for metal these are all called forming processes so with metals there's um forming redistribution processes so this at the minute is forming processes so you've got cupping and deep drawing so this is used to form tube shapes like cans and fire extinguishers and things like that so it can become deep drawing when the depth of the pressing exceeds the diameter so if it ends up being deeper than it is wider that's when it becomes deep drawing but it's still the same process it's just to do with how deep down you go um it is very close to set up so typically you would only use it in mass production hence things like pen cans and that type of, type of thing so you've got your blank again so remember the metal normally is called a blank before it's formed into the shape so your blank is clamped over a deep drawing die 
using a pressure pad, and then your hydraulic press moves the deep drawing punch to be in contact with the blank, and then it pushes the blank into the die. You've got it clamped down, pressure pads, and then the punch goes down into the die and then forces it to take the shape. And then depending on how deep you go, obviously it's either cup, it's quite small, cupping, quite deep, deep drawing. You go as far as needed, come back up again, and again you would trim the excess that you do not need. So drop forging. So this is used to shape when the metal is hot, so it's just been taken out of the forge. Uh, so this makes the product finished, it's tough and hard, so this is where it needs to be like a workshop or industrial tools. It is used for mass production. So you make a die that's made out of cast tool steel and secured onto an anvil. So then, because it's very hot, you typically will have like a, a ram is equipped with the die as well. And the metal billet, which is a bit that you are going to form, that is heated. And then the die is then closed around it. And what will happen is the ram presses down into it and it forces it to go around the, the upper and lower die, forces it because it's hot, it's then easy to work with and it takes the complete shape that you need. So next we've got raw iron forging. This is a, for, this is a form of iron that is suitable for, for uh, raw iron is a form of iron that's suitable for forging, rolling, bending, and instead of casting, the casting will be where you melt it down and pour it into a die and make it else, whereas raw iron is one where you've got to work with it, you've got to roll it, you've got to bend it, you've got to hit it. And this is because it's got a very low carbon content, which makes it malleable and suitable for hammering into shape so it isn't brittle. As well as using hydraulic rams and anvils, you can actually use hand tools. So this is where you would see people, uh, like think like Game of Thrones style things, where they have it in the, iron, in the fire, take it out onto an anvil, and then hit it with a hammer to take the shape. And you can get different uh, attachments to the anvil to sort of get the shapes and forms that you need. So typically it's heated in a gas or coke fire forge. So you would hold it with tongues and hammer it with an iron. So you also can get different kinds of tongues that can hold different parts because it can be quite difficult to hot grip on properly. And usually it would be one off or small batches as you, there's no, you can't make a former for it. You can't make a die or a mold. So it is just one person doing it. So it's quite labor intensive. It is quite a difficult skill to do. So it does take a while. So if you're like a one off one, you will probably pay quite a bit. And if you're doing it, you can charge quite a lot for your time as well. So bending. So this is what you'll do like sheet metal. Uh, so this is done using a cake. So the desired bend is achieved. You clamp the metal between matching uh, punch and die. So you've got your punch, which is the bit that punches into metal, and you've got your die, which is what gives it the overall shape. So in the example here, we've got a V die. If you had a different shape, it would take it into a different shape. So that hydraulic and pneumatic or mechanical brake, hold the metal and lower the punch down into the bend that you want. Uh, in more modern presses, you have a back gauge to actually position the metal, so it can be CNC controlled, so that is computer controlled, so you can repeat it over and over again really easily. Most common shapes are like your V-shaped bends that you want. So it does not usually combine punching or trimming, so you, don't, you tend to just take it and it's a, if there's a bend in the middle of the sheet you want, that's how you would achieve it. So rolling, so you've got hot rolling and you've got cold rolling. So hot rolling is where it's above its recrystallization temperature and cold rolling is usually done at room temperature. So typically it's used to make structural steel members like I-beams, metal stock forms, railings, tra railway tracks, that sort of thing. Hot, hot rolling means it will not have any uh, deformation or stresses which can result in it having a fault. The downside of hot rolling is it's usually covered with carbon composites because of the heating process. That then means it has to be removed afterward with acid pickling, which then basically it will make it a little bit thinner because you've, if you've got this extra carbon layer around the outside that you need to remove so it ends up being slightly thinner than you thought it was going to be so you need to you need to consider that in the actual manufacturing process cold rolling has a tighter tolerance so it's expected it, the way you make it it should be a lot more accurate because you don't have those carbon com, uh, carbon deposits on there um typically using home appliances like filing cabinets stairs saucepans that sort of thing so now we're going on to what's called the redistribution processes. So this is where you'll take your metal, melt it down, pour it in, and you're redistributing the overall shape of it. So before it was the forming processes where you're just going to take the shape and form it by rolling, bending, hitting, pressing, that sort of thing. So now is the redistribution process. So this is, again, like I said, this is where you melt it down and then you would take it and pour it into a mould. So used to form, so it's typically used to form uh, high melting point metals. 
So this is done in specialist factories that are called foundries, and the moulds are made from sand, hence the name sand casting. So the process is quite slow and labour intensive because you've got to, first of all you've got to make the moulds. The moulds are single use because they are normally destroyed afterwards. Um, sometimes, depending on what you've made it from, you may use it one or two more times. Um, depending what you've made it from, but it won't last that long. And typically you make like heavy duty part branches, drain covers, post boxes, that type of thing. So what will happen? Step one, so you make your pattern, which is the mold that you want. So it's usually out of wood. Sometimes it's foam. Foam's not used as much now because it started to make like a bit fumey. So if you use too much foam, it can be quite like bad for the lungs. So that is uh, placed into the drag and packed tightly with sand. So that's Literally, a little low, low sand, like with the sand castle, and you pack it down nice, nice, and tightly. Then, step two up here, the drag is then put it over, and a second box is then clamped onto it. So, that second box is called a cope. And then, the top of the pattern is placed in and match it up with where the bottom side of the pattern is. You then have wooden stakes that are put into cope, and this makes a spruce and riser, which is a way all like the air vents come out of. Then, sand is then packed into the cope again like it was in the drag so you're now packing the second side down with lots and lots of sand you do it around the spruce and the riser because this is where you're going to pour in the liquid metal so then step four is the cope and drag are opened up and the mold of spruce and riser are removed now this is the risky bit because if it's not packed tightly enough it's quite loose sand it can end up collapsing so that's why it's quite a labor intensive quite a difficult process you've got to make sure you do it nice and tightly once you've done that Vents are made by poking it. Like you get metal spikes, poke it through the sand, and that is what makes vents to like let air bubbles and excess come out. Then what will happen? Molten metal is poured into the basin, uh, and then it will come up. And then what? The whole point of the riser is when that fills up, you know the whole thing has been filled. Once that's done, it's left to cool. You then open up and remove the excess. So then we've got die casting and gravity die casting. So pressure die casting, we make atoms very quickly in high volume. So you've got a hydraulic plunger. So this forces a shot, a very quick shot of molten metal through the gooseneck in slice. So the gooseneck is the part that's just called here because it's not it looks like a gooseneck, funny enough. So you then have the plunger comes down into the chamber and then that shot of molten metal comes through into the die and cools down. And then for the gravity die processing, so you have your molten metal that's poured into the runner and then gravity does the work for you. Gravity makes the metal go into the die. You're not forcing, it's not like with a plunger where you're forcing it in. It just drips down into it. So like with sand casting, the risers fill up when you know it's full. So that's why there's two holes there. You're not pouring it into. So you pour it down into the runner. It comes back up the riser when you know it's full. Let it cool, remove it, and then you would then remove the excess bit at the top. So typically that's used for lower melting point metals like aluminium based alloys, zinc and things like that. You can use like tall steel moulds that are reusable so you wouldn't have to make a mould over and over again. So the complex thing cost of making dyes means this is done in very large batch or mass production. Uh, it does create a really, really nice finish. Obviously you've got to just trim the excess off like any wastage, you've got to get rid of that. But the finish of it is excellent. Uh, typically things like alloy wheels, engine parts, a uh, little war mount, like collectible figures like Warhammer, that sort of thing we've made from it as well. So investment casting. So this is where you will have an exact replica of what you need to make. So you need to make is made out of wax. Uh, if you need to make loads of them, you'd make them all together and join in what's called a tree. So in this example here, they're making, got you. this is the one shape you want, but we need to have loads of them. You attach them all to a tree. Then they are dipped, dip coated with clay and fired in a kiln to bake it. So the whole outside of the clay is there. The wax is then burned away, because the wax has a lower melting point than the clay, uh, to leave a hollow clay. So the clay is completely hollow and the shape that you need. Metal is then poured into the mould and you let it cool. You then break the mould and then you've got the pieces. That's why it's investment casting, because you're investing, like this is where essentially you're sacrificing the mould that you want. So you make two more, so you make it out of wax first, dip it in clay, Remove the wax by heating it all up so you've got the clay outside, pour the metal into the clay, and then you just break off the clay and you're left with what you need. So, pewter casting, I imagine this is one quite commonly done. 
in, in your secondary school. They're used for small scales, things like jewellery. Uh, typically, moulds are single use. Um, most people will probably have like laser cut a uh, little MDF mould or plywood moulds like that. But you can get metal moulds uh, that can be used over and over again because it has got a, a higher melting point in the pewter. So the mould is melted and clamped together. Um, you then take your pewter, you put it into a ladle and you heat it up with a flame. Once that's a liquid, you then pour it into the mould and let it cool. Once that's done, open the mould, remove it, and then you've got to clean it up. You've got to file clean it, wet and dry, uh, buffer it. It takes quite a lot of cleaning to do, as I'm sure if you've done it at secondary school, you're aware. So this is now wasting one. So we did uh, forming, which is where you take the shape and form it into something else. We have the redistribution processes where you melted it down, poured it into something else. And then wasting is where you have like a chunk of material and you're removing the areas that you don't want. So there's three main ones for that. So we've got milling machine. But if you did engineering um, at GCSE, uh, this is a very, very common process. So it looks quite uh, similar to a pillar drill. But the piece of work stays where it is. Uh, sorry, no, so the piece of work is what actually moves. Uh, so it will move on an X, Y, and Z axis. So it will go left, right, up, down, backwards, and forwards. So you've got your cutters. So there's spin around, and you move the material up to the cutter. So you've got two types of cutters. One way you can go, uh, you've got up and down into the material, or you've got one when you go down and into the side of the material. So you can do like uh, grooves and that sort of thing. So it lets you do like slots, sharp edges, or you can even clean the surfaces as well. So flame cutting. So this uses oxyacetylene gas that produces a very intense flame of around 3,500 3, degrees. And this will let you cut low carbon and alloy steel. And then you've got turning. So on a center lathe where you have a chuck, your material will go into the chuck. And then you've got on your tool post, you have your tool holder. And depending on what you need to do, it will have uh, different profiles that let you cut shapes. You can clean material off, you can cut grooves into it, you can change the shape of it, and that sort of thing. And then once you've done that, you can then, in the tailstock, you can have things like drill bits, so you can bore holes out of it like that. So next we've got plasma cutting. So this is where a superheated iodized gas that, um, is used so a plasma arc is directed out of the torch where the gas is forced through a tiny nozzle. The electric arc is generated from a transformer which combined with the gas forms a jet of plasma. So plasma typically is around 28,000 degrees and will be used for one-off production. Laser cutting, which I'm sure a lot of people use laser cutters out second floor or in college before as well. So you have a high-powered laser, it's directed through uh, optics, which is lens like glasses. Um, so the laser melts away the material and air blows the material through the bed. It's used for one-off or big batches. Uh, new lasers are starting to have the power of plasma cutters, but they are quite expensive. Um, but you can now get like little, you can have like big industrial lasers all the way down to like tabletop lasers as well. And then you've got punching and stamping. This is where a CNC piece of machinery. Uh, so like where you have your die and your blank and you have your material in there, and the punch and the stamp will go through and form it and then trim the excess as well. So forming timbers. So you've got turning, routing, and milling. So turning, kind of similar to the center lay with metal, but this is a lot more like uh, by hand. So with the uh, lathe, with metal work, it's all done. The tools and everything are all set, and you just move them along paths, whereas with the turning, you tend to hold uh, the pieces yourself. So you can do either from a sensor, so you attach it to the sensor and it spins around and you remove excess. You have a face plate, where that's where you tend to do like hollow like bowls and cups and that sort of thing, or a chuck. Uh, you can make things like bowls, chairs, table legs, that sort of thing. So it'll spin around, you can change the speed of it, and then you'll have on the tool rest, you'll have either a gouge or a scraper, and then depending, you have different shapes of them to do what sort of form you want. Uh, routing. So you can have like, you have like typically a big plunge router. You can have smaller handheld routers as well. This will let you make slots and holes across the surface of a piece of timber. So it will plunge down and the cutter will spin around and cut into the material. And then milling is similar to metal. Um, you can still use a milling machine, but you tend not to because it needs to be a lot faster speed. And then actually you tend to get like wood shavings going to the parts and it sort of junks it all up. You've then got 
formal materials for timber, where you've got things like lamination and steam bending. So lamination is where you make your mould and you're gluing layers on top of each other. Uh, and then you clamp them down into place and then you let it dry uh, and then you've got your shape. So if you're going to have like extreme curves, you might need to soak the surface of the material, the timber a little bit just to make it a little more pliable. And you can also use a bag press where you will uh, basically vacuum press it. So it'll be in a big plastic bag. You'll have your mould and your material and you'll put it on and then you'll get a vacuum and it'll suck all the air out and it'll form it around it. And then you've got the steam bending, so your timber will be put into the chest. So the chest is then closed off and there is essentially what sort of like a kettle is attached to it where water is boiled and the steam in the pipe goes into the chest. And while the steam is in there, the timber absorbs the steam, becomes pliable, take it out, put it into a clamp, let it dry and it takes the shape. Um, depending on how dense, how thick the material is, depends how long you need to let it steam for. Okay, so a couple of questions I want to try and answer. So what is the difference between addition, wastage and pouring processes? Can you explain the process of making fizzy drink cans? Can you explain the process for making a chair leg? And then can you explain the process for making plastic carrier bags? So that is the end of forming materials. If you've got more questions, please send me a message on Teams or on uh, email.